talking about taxes and your money today on Fixing the Money Thing. It is tax season. I know that's your favorite time of year, but uh, gosh, we have a great guest. Dan, the IRS, that's, uh, is that a good topic? I mean, you know, people don't want to talk about the IRS, but they don't want to pay taxes either, so we got to help them understand what's going on. You're right, nobody wants to deal with the IRS, but everybody has to deal with the IRS, whether you like it or not. What do we need as a consumer need to know about what's going on at the IRS right now? This employee retention credit is, is the mother of all complex elements of the tax code. Gary and his friend, tax litigator, author, and executive director of the Tax Freedom Institute, Dan Pilla, discuss what you need to know for this tax season today on Fixing the Money Thing. I'm Gary Cassie, and for nine years, we lived in a chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, I want my people free. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. You'll never find your destiny until you fix the money thing. Hey, welcome to Fixing the Money Thing. I'm Gary Cassie, and we've got some amazing things to discuss today. It is tax season. I know that's your favorite time of year, but uh, gosh, we have a great guest. Dan Pilla has been here every spring with us, I don't know how many years, long time, to help us prepare for tax season. So many things changing. Let's bring Dan on right now. Dan, how are you doing? I'm well, Gary. How are you doing? It's good to I'm see you. It's been a while. Good. Yeah. Well, Dan, IRS, that's, uh, is that a good topic? I mean, you know, people don't want to talk about the IRS, but they don't want to pay taxes either, so we got to help them understand what's going on. Yeah, we, we do need to help people, Gary, because you're right. Nobody wants to deal with the IRS, but everybody has to deal with the IRS, whether you like it or not. This is the only area of the law, Gary, that touches every American, and it doesn't make any difference how old you are. You could be a little bitty baby, one year old. You could be a senior citizen, 99 years old, and still have a tax obligation. The obligation to deal with your tax return filing and payment has nothing to do with your age. A lot of people think, well, I'm a senior citizen. I don't have to worry about it. Not true. It depends on what your income is. It's all income driven. Yeah. So we all have to be aware of this stuff. That's right. Before we get started too long, Dan, just give me a little bit of your credentials. I mean, you've been doing, sure. uh, you're an IRS attorney or tax attorney, I should say, taking on the IRS on behalf of the, of the consumer for how many years? Yeah, so it's north of 45 years now, Gary. And just for clarity, I've never worked for the IRS. I, 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 so I fixed that. My I said dear that, friend, I Gary, it. don't accuse me of I having worked for the IRS. I caught myself. I caught myself. Yeah. And how many books have you written about the IRS? How many books have you written about the IRS? I've written about the IRS. So, how so many? I've, I've, spent, I've spent 45 years as, as, as uh, more than 45 years as, as, as a, as a, uh, as a uh, litigator working on behalf of individuals and small businesses, specifically in the area of taxpayers' rights issues, problems resolution, and taxpayer uh, and IRS abuse prevention and cure. I've written 14 books on dealing with the IRS. I've, I've written, uh, you know, dozens of research reports on on, uh, on, 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 you know, tax policy issues. And I've written more than a thousand articles on various aspects of the IRS over the years. I'm regularly published by National Review, and uh, and I do you know I do uh, hundreds of interviews a year on on media across the country, helping people cope with the Internal Revenue Service. So Gary, I don't prepare tax returns for a living. Right. I get into the act after the IRS calls the return into question, and then I deal specifically in this problems resolution world. Yeah, well, thank God for people like you, Dan. I know. We've been friends for a long time. I think it's going on 26, 20, I don't know how long. It's been a while. It's, it's got to be north of that because we, we did that. We did, we did radio shows together back when you were on the radio in the mid-90s. Yeah, man. yeah, that's right. Well, anyway, uh, quite frankly, IRS scares people. Taxes sure. scare people. And I've heard you say many times, the tax code is how many words or how many pages is it? Well, it's about 14. It's about 4 million words in length. And it was changed more than 6,000 times just since 2001 alone. So this is what the problem is. Yes. You know, it's one thing to have a complicated tax code. No matter how complicated something is, Gary, if you spend enough time on it, you can work your way through it and get your arms around it. 
The problem is we have a tax code that's constantly changing. So not only is it complex, it's changing all the time. So once you think you understand something, they change it, the rules are different, now you gotta start over again. Yeah, I know you also train CPAs or people that prepare taxes too about what you've learned. But today, let's focus on, first off, bring us up to speed, uh, what changes, what, what do we need as a consumer need to know about what's going on at the IRS right now? Yeah, that's a good question. And let's focus on businesses in, in, in particular. You know, as uh, you are probably aware, Gary, of the, uh, of the Employee Retention Credit was part of the CARES Act mm -hmm. that was passed in March of 2020. The Employee Retention Credit was a tax credit that was granted to businesses who kept employees on the payroll during the period of these government shutdowns that started in early 2020 and, and rolled through uh, much of 2021. The employee retention credit's a refundable credit. And what that means is that you actually get more money back from the government than you paid in as a business in employment taxes in the first place. And this was a huge, a huge windfall for businesses. Millions of businesses collected uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. I think I think the Treasury allocated about eight eight hundred and fifty billion dollars to fund this employee retention credit, and businesses all across the country claim that credit. Now, Gary, you probably remember that almost overnight, these marketing companies showed up on the scene offering to do uh, to 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 make the uh, the uh, employee retention credit claims on behalf of businesses in exchange for a percentage of the of the recovery. Right. 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 So, so there, these companies were out there all over the place offering, uh, offering the services of preparing their tax returns to get the credit. Well, it turns out, Gary, that a lot of these businesses were, were, were submitting claims. On, a lot of these marketing companies were submitting claims on behalf of businesses that did not qualify. So the IRS started to panic about this in, in the summer of 2023. I think it was August of 2023. They announced that we're going to slow down our processing of these credits. We're going to start taking a more careful look at these things. Then in September of 2023, they froze the processing altogether, and they stopped processing these things. Now we're at the point, Gary, where there's two programs that the IRS initiated. One program is a withdrawal program. It allows companies to actually withdraw the employee retention credit claim they filed if they haven't been paid on it yet. And the other program allows companies what's called a voluntary disclosure option, where they can go in there and say, look, if we were induced by a marketing company to file a claim that's not legitimate, we want to withdraw that claim also. And so that gives them an opportunity to pay back uh, the credit without penalties and interest. So businesses out there that that made an employee retention credit claim need to look at what they did. It's not just a cut and dry thing because there's all kinds of things. We talked about complexity a minute ago. Yeah. This employee retention credit is, is the mother of all complex elements of the tax code. First of all, the credit started, as I said, in March of 2020. Uh, March of 2020. It was changed three more times and then finally repealed retroactively. And every time they changed it, they changed the rules for the credit, Gary. So this thing is, is monstrously, monstrous, monstrously complex, mm. but, but we have figured out how it works. So my point is that businesses that have claimed this credit need to take a look at what they did because there is a potential. I'm not saying it's absolutely true, but there is a potential that they made an incorrect claim that needs to be looked at. Now, you just said they should take a look at what they did in the same sentence. You said there's nothing more complex in the world. How are they going to know anything about if they did it right or wrong? Well, that, that's, you know, that's a good question. And, and the typical business person does not know whether they did it right or wrong. And that's where counsel comes into play. There's plenty of competent counsel out there, Gary, uh, attorneys and, and, and accountants and enrolled agents that have a lot of experience with the employee retention credit from a tax professional standpoint, not from a marketing standpoint. In other words, you want to deal with professional counsel, not a marketer. You want to deal with somebody that's got experience in the area as a tax pro, not somebody who's hustling a refund claim to get a percentage of the recovery that they get on your behalf. That's the difference here. That's yeah. who you need to consult to get some insight to get some insight into this thing. Now, assuming that a business has not filed that yet, and there are competent people, 
Uh, when does the deadline occur that they would not be able to file that? Yeah, that's a good question, too, because the, because what we're talking about here is we're talking about amending employment tax returns on which the credit is claimed. All right. So now uh, the employment the tax year 2021 was the last year for which an employee retention credit was available. All right. It was the first three quarters of 2021. In rare circumstances, the fourth quarter of 2021 is also available. So the way the statute of limitations works is it starts running with the filing of the last tax return. I'm talking about employment tax returns, Forms uh, Forms 941 here now. So that would have been filed in January of 2022. You got three years from that date. So that would bring us to January of 2025 in which to file an amended return for any of those quarters in 2021. So that's when the deadline for making the claim would be. Okay. Um, any advice on how to recognize a reputable uh, CPA or somebody that could handle that? Is there something I should look for? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And let's say, and let's, and let's answer that question by, by, by just listing a series of questions. You know, what experience do they have in making employee retention credit claims? Have they done this before? Have they actually read the statute themselves or are they looking at other people's analysis of the statute? One thing that I try to do, Gary, and all the things that I write is I refer or as I rely on primary source material. I never rely on secondary source material. So by that, I mean, I'm not looking at somebody else's opinion. I read the statutes, I read the regulations, I read the Internal Revenue Manual, I read the court cases. These are primary source materials. So you want to deal with somebody that is focused on understanding primary source authorities so they know exactly what's coming out of the horse's mouth and we don't worry what's coming out of the other end of the horse, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, and so okay. that, that's 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 got to be the... That's got to be the focus. You do not want to be dealing with a marketing company. You don't want to be dealing with somebody that's got the call center and they're saying, oh, yeah, you know, qualifying people over the phone. You don't want to be dealing with somebody who's qualifying people over the phone. Your qualification needs to be based on your materials. And that's the other important focus that somebody needs to look at in determining whether they're dealing with a competent professional or not. Are they looking at your paperwork? In this case, are they looking at your 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 uh, your wage statements that you paid to employees? Are they looking at the uh, the uh, activities that you were involved in? Are they looking at the manner in which you operated your business? These things all have bearing on whether that ERC claim is legitimate. Okay. Yeah. We do hear that on the radio a lot. Uh, of course, I've run into it quite often. People, um, I've run into a lot of people that have heard of the IRS kind of slowing down, and they're afraid to touch it. You know, they're they're. I'd rather just pay my well, taxes. Well, that, and, yeah, yeah, and that's another common problem. Now that the IRS has slowed down the processing of these things, there's there's some pros. Uh, some people out there say, "Oh, I'm not going to touch this. I'm not going to look at that." Well, look at it. it's it's not kryptonite, and, and it, it, you know you, you can touch it without dying if you know what you're doing. That's yeah. the key is to know what you're doing. Now, an, an, uh, another thing that that people need to be aware of here, and I don't say this say this to scare folks. I, I don't I don't as you know I don't scare people for a living. I, I give people hope and 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 a, and, a, and a way out of any situation. But we do need to know that the IRS is very carefully looking at these ERC claims. So I talked about the two programs. The number one program is the withdrawal program. If you file a claim that is questionable, that that turns out not to be accurate, and the IRS has not paid you on that claim, you can you can withdraw the claim, and the IRS attitude, IRS's attitude is no harm, no foul. All right, so we just withdraw the claim, we're good. If they paid you on the claim, and it turns out that they shouldn't have, you can involve yourself in what's called the voluntary disclosure program that the IRS has set up. That program allows you to step up to the IRS and say, look, guys, we, we made a claim we shouldn't have made. Uh, we, you know, they don't really even ask for an explanation. You just admit you shouldn't have made the claim. You agree to pay back 80% of the claim, Gary. So if they paid you, uh, if they paid you uh, $100,000, you pay back 80 grand with no penalties and no interest. And again, they call it even. All right. So there's no penalties there. So wow. this is a good opportunity. This is an excellent opportunity for people to correct this situation without getting ground into powder as a result of the mistakes they made. Now, that said, the IRS has been very aggressively setting up 
a, an audit program to look at these claims. So if you think you've got a problem with an ERC claim, don't wait to be audited. Have it looked at now and take advantage of one of these two programs if, if, if you need to. Okay. Okay. It's good. Uh, let's, let's change topics now, Dan. What else? Uh, what's, what's happening elsewhere in the IRS? Well, one other th here's here's another thing that's uh, that that people need to know about Gary. Starting in uh, in in uh, the middle of 2020, again in the teeth of the COVID shutdown. Of course, you probably remember that the IRS itself shut down uh, for about six or eight weeks during uh, during the summer of 2020 and got massively massively backlogged in terms of yes. managing their letters and and processing tax returns and so on to the point, Gary, where there was 30. Five million documents in the Internal Revenue Service piled up in their mail rooms that were not getting processed. Oh the IRS God. was just overloaded with this stuff. So they actually shut down their collection notice machine. They turned the switch off on the collection notice machine, and they did that, I believe it was about July of 2020. And they said, you know, we're getting so many letters back from people that we can't process. That's going to lead to further problems. So let's just shut down this, this notice program. So there's a, a series of preliminary notices that the IRS stopped mailing out in the summer of 2020. Now, fast forward to the summer of 2021. The IRS was still overloaded with documents that they couldn't process. And so they suspended the mailing of a whole uh, a whole additional series of collection letters. So now we've got you know about 12, 15 uh, or so collection letters that the IRS has completely stopped mailing out, and they stopped mailing. They 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 continued that that uh, that pause period. Let's say where the where the uh, collection machine was turned off through the rest of 2021, all of 2022, and most of 2023. Now in January of 2024, the IRS announced that it is turning that machine back on, mm. right? So if you've got a delinquent tax liability and it's been sitting there and you're saying to yourself, ha, ah, the IRS forgot about me. Mm. I haven't been getting any notices. Well, guess yeah. what, friends? They didn't forget about you. They just turned the switch off on the mailing machine. That switch is now going back on. The letters are starting to come out and you are going to be back in collection. So now is the time to take advantage of an opportunity to negotiate with the IRS, especially if you've got a tax debt, Gary, that you owe and can't pay. A lot of folks out there uh, that have delinquencies have very, very significant tax problems. 60% of the people that owe money to the IRS owe more than $10,000. And, and, and for, for folks that owe 30, 50, 100 grand, you know, that's all, might as well be all the money in the world. So here's an opportunity now to take advantage of this, of this lull to get your situation resolved through some kind of a settlement program. So that would be that would be uh, 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 you know something that I would very seriously consider if I had this delinquent tax problem. I mean, I know you work with people all the time that do have those kinds of problems. Uh, but you know, let's talk about before the problem. I mean, how can people avoid getting themselves in that situation? Well, yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Now let's talk about small businesses because uh, small businesses, probably more than anybody else, Gary, are the ones that are in trouble with the IRS. And and the reason small businesses are in trouble with the IRS is because well, there's a lot of reasons, but but the chief reason, in, in my opinion, is that small businesses don't have the luxury, if we can call it a luxury, of wage withholding, where they don't have money coming out of their paychecks every week or every month that gets automatically paid to the IRS by somebody else. So you don't have to worry about writing a check to the IRS. As a matter of fact, you know, about 80, 85 percent, roughly 80 percent of the people in America get a tax refund at the end of the year precisely because they have that money coming out of their paycheck every month and they don't have to write a check to the IRS. In fact, people overpay their taxes, which is a whole different mistake, uh, you know, that we can talk about as well. But as far as small businesses are concerned, they don't have that luxury, Gary. That money's not coming out of their paycheck. They have the responsibility to write that check on a regular basis. Now, a self-employed person is supposed to write a check to the IRS at least quarterly for estimated payments. All right. Well, most small people, small business people don't do that because they're, you know, the, oh, you're, 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 as my dad used to say, he was self-employed all his life. When you're a self-employed person, one month you eat the chicken, the next month you eat the feathers, right? So it's, it's the, you know, the income is up, down, up, down. And then for a lot of small businesses, it's unpredictable. 
And, and so that, you know, that becomes a, a difficult handicap. How much do I send in? How much don't I send in? I need the money for, for the rent this month. I need the money to, you know, for the kids braces, whatever the situation may be. A small business person needs to get in the habit of producing a profit and loss statement on a month, at least a quarterly basis. I suggest that it should be done on a monthly basis so you can see exactly where you're at as far as your business profit is concerned. Your estimated payments need to be based on your profit. So if you're doing the profit and loss statement at least quarterly, if not monthly, then you take the big swings out of the situation. If your income is high, you pay a little more to the IRS in estimated payments. If your income is low, you pay a little less. But the point is that you're making the estimated payments on a regular ongoing basis and you don't get yourself into the problem of the big delinquency. What, what blindsides small businesses is they go into their tax preparer's office in March. They dump all their documents on the desk. The preparer puts together the tax return and the preparer says, I got good news, your tax return's all done. Come on in and pick it up. Well, they're e-filing these days. But the point is that the guy goes in to sign the tax return and he's staring at a $15,000 tax bill. Well, I didn't know I was gonna have a $15,000 tax bill. Why do I have a $15,000 tax bill? Well, the, the reason is because you haven't been making estimated payments along the way, taking small bites of the apple over the course of the year and not trying to swallow the whole thing in one bite in April. That's the problem that small businesses have. So we gotta get in the practice of making this profit and loss statement on at least quarterly, if not a monthly basis, and making the estimated payments as you go along. You don't have a responsibility to overpay your taxes, but also you get penalized for underpaying the taxes. So you need you need to get you need to get the the, uh, the your arms around what your profit and loss situation is. Now let me talk about another mistake that small businesses make, and it grows out of this first one we just talked about. Guy walks into his accountant's office. He's looking at the tax return on the desk. He owes 15 grand. He doesn't have the money. Well, I'm not going to file the return. File, like, give me an extension. This is the mistake they make all the time. They'll say to their accountant, give me an extension. I'll have the money by October. Okay, accountant files the extension. They don't have the money by October. All right, because now we are nine or 10 months in to the next year's tax liability, right? You got a tax liability every single year if you're in an income. So I owed money for last year. Here it is October of the following year. I haven't paid last year. I haven't paid anything for this year. Now I got two problems instead of just one. And so they don't file the returns. And this pattern of non-filing starts and it grows and it grows and it grows. And before you know it, they've got six, eight, 10, 12 tax returns that are not filed. I'm dealing with a guy right now, a client that I got on my desk hasn't filed tax returns, Gary, in the last 10 years. And this mm -hmm. is exactly the model that he followed to get himself in yeah. this kind of trouble. And so I laid out a whole, a whole plan for him that's going to focus on getting him, getting this situation turned around. And where does it start? It starts with estimated payments in 2024 based on 2024 income and expenses. You know, we're, we're, we're what, five weeks? weeks into the new year, six weeks into the new year, all right, already we can make a profit and loss statement based on the first month of his operations and make a small estimated payment for 2024 and start to get him out of the woods. This is the thing that we got to do is get him on track to get out of the woods. So small yeah. businesses need to wrap their heads around this. Yeah, that's good. You know what, Dan, we're going to have to continue this to the next program tomorrow because we've just scratched the surface. But great information, Dan, great information. We'll be right back here in a minute. Tomorrow we'll carry this on. But uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us here at Fixing the Money Thing. And uh, Dan, before I actually hang up with you right here, what's the name of your book for small business? Can you tell me about that real quick? Yeah, the book is Dan Pillow's Small Business Tax Guide. It's available at taxhelponline.com. That's taxhelponline.com. Excellent. Yeah, it's great, great, great book.